I'd like to clarify some of the language I've used in the handheld game exercise description. This might be optional for some of you, but I'm hoping it helps fill in some gaps about the technical terms that I've used. I'm just going to walk through the exercise looking for jargon and try to help fill in with a little bit more context and meaning. Let's go right to the objectives, because that's really, I think, the most important part. And right away we see design a simple, real-time handheld game. Probably the biggest question here is, what, is, what does real-time mean? And casually what I mean is a game that uh, can respond to events at any time. So it's not turn-based, but there's some kind of ongoing process. Video games are real-time in the sense that there's a continuously evolving animation, there's action all the time, things are happening non-stop. In principle, you can make a turn-based game here, which, is, which is, doesn't have action that's unfolding all the time, but I'd still like it to have some aspect where the process of the game itself can unfold at real time, meaning sort of asynchronously on the clock. There I'm using more words. We'll come back to asynchronous. So technically, real time has a specific technical meaning. It means a system that can respond to events within a bounded time interval. Most of the time, real time means fast systems that can handle events quickly. So if things happen in the world, they respond, they react quickly, things happen. On a more technical level, it means that there's just guarantees that things don't take too long. As a matter of practice, what I really mean is I don't want using delay in your program. I want your program to be monitoring inputs um, at all times so that it is ready to handle things that happen. Which leads us to number two, which is implement low latency processing of asynchronous inputs and outputs. Low latency, latency is the time between events, so between an action and its reaction. So a low latency system is one that can respond quickly to outside events. And you know, most modern computers are existing in a world where there's, they're surrounded by asynchronous events from keyboard and mouse clicks to network traffic to, um, you know, those are the big ones. IO also comes in as asynchronous. The idea is build a structure in your program which is ready to process things as they occur without much delay. So if the user makes an input or makes a selection or responds with a button push, that some part of your program can, can uh, be ready to process that uh, and produce some kind of reaction or change some output within a very short time interval. And this is what makes systems responsive. And honestly, for controlling physical systems, it's very important because many physical systems require close, close control where events physically happen and then the response via actuation also happens very quickly in order to keep them stable. So learning how to build a low latency system so that inputs are quickly read and quickly produce outputs um, is, a, is a great boon to making these systems go. Asynchronous here means uh, basically happening at arbitrary time. So synchronous events might be two events that occur simultaneously or events that occur on some kind of regular periodic clock. For us, asynchronous is everything else. So events that occur um, either at an arbitrary time or an unknown time or two events that can occur in either order, all of these have asynchronous properties where it's not bound to time and bound to a clock. And so a system that can handle asynchronous events it has, has basically the expectation that an event can occur at any time, and the code is written to accommodate that. Event loops in state machines I talk about in another video uh, that was assigned a day or two ago um, in, a little, in quite a bit more detail. State machines are really kind of a big topic. They're a computer science idea that is very foundational and uh, a big notion that you know, can be implemented in a lot of different sort of contexts. Here, what I really mean is, um, let's very carefully consider the set of variables that define the system, that define the current state of the system. And state is sort of reflexively defined there. It's state is that set of bits that are those variables. The idea is that the, the state of the system is the minimum set of information that completely captures the history of the system and then, of course, defines how it acts into the future. For a game, often that is some information about the recent moves or the future move, the near future moves of the game or the score or like the place and the melody that's playing, any kind of bits that describe what's going on. And normally we end up capturing these in some variables, either in an object or in this case, in Arduino style, in global variables. And those the designing the system involves carefully thinking through what is the state? Like what are the actual bits? What are the numbers that are stored to keep track of the history of what's happened and then make decisions about the future? And the, the machine part of the state machine is the set of rules that both respond to events based upon that state and change the state. 
there's a kind of graph notation in computer science which involves making bubbles for representing states and transitions using arcs, which some people have seen. But the, the key idea more is uh, this, the essence of thinking through the computer it has some fixed memory of what it understands about the world at a given moment that is captured in some numbers. And the, the more that you can think through what is the right set of numbers for both the game history and or in some sense the physical history of the world, the more that you can say you've modeled the problem in order to, to, to decide how to write the rules that govern how that state progresses. That's a pretty abstract notion. And honestly, the other video talks much more about a very specific way of coding involving a set of state variables and a switch case structure and sort of bodies of codes that are branch targets. Um, but the, the essence of the idea has more to do with this kind of object-oriented thinking about there being data that represents the world. For us, that's variables with numbers and then rules that use that data to govern how they, how they operate and update those rules. And those end up being you know, functions that look at the values of, of the state variables as they're processing input events and making decisions about how to either update the state or produce a reaction. The event loop is a very specific kind of programming style that lends itself to these properties of being asynchronous, low latency, and handling state clearly. A lot of application programming revolves around event loops. A typical application on a desktop has a major event loop in which uh, there's a, there are all kinds of events like mouse clicks and keyboard clicks and network traffic is, is brought into one point in the program, which then dispatches to, a number, to any number of different points that might handle and process that event. And the idea mostly being that there's always a, a, a part of the program that is ready to receive data and then quickly act on it in some way. And there's a variety of things that might happen, like the mouse click can trigger some other window system events or data is stored and possibly queued for processing. But the idea being that there's, there's a structure where there's a single point of entry which receives execution frequently in order to always be ready to process things that happen, um, typically asynchronous. In our case, we're writing fairly simple loops that have not much in the way of actual data structure. There aren't queues and lists and buffers and things that are storing events or keeping track of background events. There's not a future time history. And so really what it is is a polling loop. Polling is the technical term for um, a process that repeatedly queries some state. So in, in the case, whenever you have like a digital read in a loop where you're just doing digital, digital read again and again and again, you can be said to be polling that input, meaning you're constantly requesting its status and then detecting when there's some change and acting on it. And the polling action is that digital read um, fetching the value from the hardware what the current state input is. So an event loop is a structure which we've been sort of starting to use in some examples. In the other video, I talk about it in more detail, where the loop function runs constantly. There's never a delay. And so at every given loop cycle through the loop, the loop code can consult the clock. It can do digital reads and pull inputs. It could pull analog inputs. And the values are processed. And then a set of rules is evaluated to decide whether to act on them. The truth is, in most of our programs, Many times, many iterations of that loop, nothing will happen. It's just simply waiting for time to elapse or an input to change. But the idea is all the inputs are checked as fast as possible so that when something does happen, there's a low latency response. Like there's a very short time interval that passes before there's some kind of action takes place. We talked in class considerably about parameterized functions and action primitives. And in, it's a fancy term that really just means breaking down the actions of the game into sort of units of action that make sense as a programmer and trying to reuse code by uh, providing parameters that can produce you know, a family of different kinds of outcomes based upon some input. A lot of games have very structured kinds of actions. There's some animation that plays, there's some melody that plays, there's some set of motions that happen on a servo, and all of these things um, either repeat in different contexts or have some subtle variation based upon the game state. So these are, these are opportunities to write to sort of capture your understanding of the game design as a, as a function that produces some kind of output with a logical set of parameters that govern what it does. And then if, if that is built as a foundation of some kind of action primitives that perform the actual sort of performative aspects of the game, then in the logic of the game, it's simpler to write function calls that sort of use appropriate parameters for the given game situation to make that kind of output. But more or less what it boils down to is thinking through how to how to simplify your understanding of the problem into some well-chosen functions with well-chosen arguments that capture your understanding of the kind of physical actions of the game, um, either to interpret input or to produce output, and then using those as building blocks in the rest of the program.
Number four was write code with integrated debugging using the serial port for user console communication. Mostly we've just been using the serial port for output, and that's all I really mean here is thinking through ways of building an extra code into your program that generates output for the sole purpose of debugging. I mean, keep in mind for, for a lot of these games, the serial port is, is invisible, right? If it's a physical handheld game, normally it's only the over interface of buttons and switches that is what the user perceives. And the serial port is only an affordance for debugging. It's, you know, when you're actually building the game, you might plug in a computer to monitor it. But during actual activity of a handheld game, you never see that output. So it's, it's built into the program as a way to help debug it. But honestly, in most programs, you end up leaving it in place because it's simpler just to leave it in place and not change anything than to try to pull all the debugging code out and possibly break something. The most sophisticated version of this will come to you, which is to also use input. It's possible to build in some parsing into your program so if a person types in some string or text into the console window, it gets sent down to the Arduino, and then the Arduino program can interpret that. That lends itself to some very sophisticated debugging where the Arduino program might be doing some real-time activity and running some hardware, but can also then interpret commands either to query state or to modify state or trigger certain outcomes that help you to build in a basically built-in debugging portion of your program that you can then use while you're testing to test things out. I frequently do this when I have some piece of hardware that I'm trying to, to both operate as well as evaluate. Having a, a way to send down some commands just to cause the program to enter some test mode where it exercises the hardware helps disambiguate, like is, it, is the hardware working or is it a software problem? And by putting that into the, into the program in the first place, I kind of build in the hooks for testing itself while I'm going. So that's, that's more advanced. We haven't gotten to kind of input functions, but it is possible to have a console text input be sent into the Arduino and then cause the program to do something different. That's a kind of quick run through through the, through the objectives. And um, let's sort of go down a little bit further, see if we can come up with some more, uh, some more jargon down below. Um, tangible game experience. I think what I'm really getting at here is the tradition of a handheld game is like I just said, it's sort of tangible inputs. It's visible lights and motion, sounds you hear. It's not about either kind of pure text output or like very graphic LCD output. And this is well in keeping with the kinds of things that we'll be able to build. If you build a form that has a few actuators, maybe it can have some funny actions or do something over time using fairly simple hardware that would constitute the game itself. The idea is to keep it as visual as possible, as tactile as possible, and make it as little as possible about some kind of like symbolic output. Real-time return-based is a game strategy, right? Real-time games are like arcade games or video games where the action is constantly unfolding uh, throughout time on a continuous basis. And turn-based games, there's definitely a sense of being one player versus computer and back and forth and kind of turn-taking element. That is actually somewhat independent whether the program is real-time. A turn-based game can still be implemented by a real-time program. And what is gained is the ability to handle asynchronous events even in turn-based gameplay. So for example, if you have a turn-based game, it could still be doing things like playing animations on, on hardware or playing melodies on a speaker. And that processing of those melodies might be a real-time activity. It takes place over time. And even though the turn-based game might be waiting for some kind of input, perhaps while it's waiting, it's, it's issuing prompts or it's issuing some other animation or it's playing a melody. All those are real-time activities that can take place even while it's waiting for a response. So turn-based turn, turn and real-time um, sometimes do get correlated with kind of you know scripted versus real time programming styles, but um, it's I want to just make the point that that really is a game design element about what the game itself is trying to do. I do say timing and pacing are important elements of game design. I mean the truth is in almost all these Arduino programs, timing is is the crucial element that we control the most. So outputs that play take place over time, you know there's some kind of sense of the input from the user occurring over time as well, and kind of just carefully considering timing often is. The difference between something that really works and doesn't work. Um, I mentioned solitaire puzzle in there as, as kind of just to say that um, I think we're assuming these games are single player because they're implemented in Tinkercad and also many traditional handheld games are single player but even within that there's a number of gameplay styles. I consider a solitaire puzzle to be a puzzle where it's not the, the nature of the game itself is that you're you're fighting against the puzzle or not fighting necessarily you're trying to complete a puzzle there's some kind of uh, process you're trying to reason through or manipulate, and if you succeed, you know it, which is a sort of distinct kind of game feeling from having an opponent who's a computer. And a lot of two-player games, 
that get turned into a handheld game. The computer takes the place of an opponent, and there's definitely a feeling of competing against an, you know, some other being. That is sort of a distinctly different style than the solitaire game, where there's a puzzle that you're trying to somehow manipulate. I say there's no coin acceptor component. At some point in the lab, we did actually have a physical coin acceptor, and it is, was possible to make a machine that took quarters. Um, and that was a fun part of, of, uh, of these things. Just know that you can actually buy those things for real. It's actually possible to put a coin acceptor on any game. Um, the electronics aren't all that complicated. Uh, let's sort of go down a little bit further. I, I talked a little about game design, and I'll sort of map that out. I'll say that in advance, like I'm not really a game designer myself. And so I can implement a game, certainly, um, and can talk to someone about game design, although the sophisticated nature of game design um, I won't address. <clears throat> but by game concept, what I'm really getting at is I think having some having a design helps. Knowing what game you're trying to play before you begin coding, I think, is a very important step. The more that you can map out what are the inputs, what are the outputs, what are the rules, what's the gameplay, what's the end condition, um, in what cases do you win or lose or fail or succeed, um, can you account for every outcome? Can every possible state that you get into uh, be, a, be known and evaluated, and then can you plan for it? The more that you have all those things in mind, the more you have a well-formulated game, and then the better you have a chance you have of actually putting that into code, um, which is really a later step. Like The actual game design is separate from the coding of it, and the more that you think through the game itself, the, the more success you'll, you'll have. Um, I do say construct a circuit. This, the emphasis of this is really the software and not the circuit, although I do say pull-up resistors on your switches and ballast resistors on your LEDs, just reminding you of the kind of basic standard circuit practice within this sort of limited domain of circuit design that we're doing um, is, a, is a good, um, anyway, good practice. I say set up the shell of a text-based Arduino program. Really what I'm suggesting here when I say shell is nothing specific. It's just uh, programs develop incrementally, and, and programs with hardware in particular are best to test incrementally. You can define a basic program that just operates the hardware. You can then isolate the question, like, is my hardware working? Have I written enough code to operate the hardware successfully before you get into the complexities of the game itself? The game might be complicated and have lots of potential bugs. And if you're trying to debug your hardware while you're also debugging your game logic, you're conflating two difficult problems. So I often suggest starting with a very basic script that just has a setup function and a loop function that sets up the hardware appropriately, does some minimal testing just to make sure the hardware is running. And basically this means, can you read your switches? Can you operate your outputs? Can you make your motor move? Can you make your lights light up? And if you get if you have that to work, then you know that that scaffolding um, is, is, is ready to go on to other steps. And sometimes you put in test code that's just temporary to test your hardware while you're getting that running, and then you can remove it when you actually move on to the rest of the logic. I guess that gets into number five here. Add temporary code to test your inputs and outputs. It's just a very strong strategy to make sure that you have one part working before you move on to the next. And I think that this is a case where, I mean, often just having some simple output to the serial port helps you to validate that things are working. When I say set up the essential run loop, I'm, I'm specifically referring to, re referring to writing an event loop system. So writing a polling loop. In this case, that is probably your loop function, but also thinking through um, what are the actions that take place constantly, like reading the switch inputs? What is the processing that might take place all the time, like applying some logic to the switch inputs to figure out if they're active, you know, impressed, or eliminate invalid inputs? Things that happen continually. Um, any kind of background processing, like updating a melody player or updating some kind of light animation. All those things might happen within the event loop. And then uh, if there is some kind of scripted sequence of things that happen in the structure, I, I do strongly recommend thinking through how to implement, implement them as a state machine as per my other examples. So if there is an explicit state counter that's recording where you are in some sequence, it's possible to write a switch case statement that allows that code to keep running constantly on a single thread, like one loop function just iterating, and still execute the loop function, the, the, uh, the update rules for the state machine at the right intervals of some you know, constant rate that um, the sequence can still play out even without having delay statements. I mean, it's just basically a different way to think about how to program, which is to think about it as a series of, of sort of processes unfolding in parallel that all need to be serviced all the time. It's a kind of multi-threading within a single thread. 
And this is actually very natural for hardware. Hardware often has multiple inputs and multiple outputs. And so if every, in, if every cycle of the program, every input is sort of attended to and every output is either updated or not, there's some, some decision made, then the, pro the program is simulating having multiple threads, each responsively dealing with the, the sort of different IO in the system. And it's a powerful way to write a program. And if you can master it now, it'll serve you well when you get onto physical hardware. Um, I sort of say scripted sequence. Um, we, we've mostly been writing what I sometimes called action scripts or scripted sequences, programs that are nothing more than a, a series of outputs uh, inter, in, interspersed with delay statements produce a series of activity over time, but it's a very rigid structure. It's perfectly fine for a system with only one or a small set of outputs that just happens to ha have to happen on a clock, then digital write, delay, digital write, delay. It's a perfectly fine way to produce that kind of activity, but it's not a very versatile structure for handling more complicated sort of hardware situations. So that's kind of a quick run through. Um, I mentioned a track mode down there. Track mode is a, is a uh, term of art in the game industry for like the graphics and things that play on a video game when it's not being played to get you to come and see it. Um, that's, that's sophisticated. I think one of the highest level thing I can say here is uh, this is actually a fairly sophisticated uh, exercise. It should be hard for most of you. I expect it to be actually pretty difficult. And there's a lot being introduced at the same time. Getting right into the complexities of kind of real-time programming and state machine writing and event loop structures all at the same time is asking quite a bit. But the more that you can see all those elements as working together to produce a sort of richer programming style, uh, the closer we'll be to writing programs that can deal with harder in a more sophisticated way. So I'm hoping that this will help you to kind of see an alternative to the kind of programs that we've been writing and hopefully that will help us to do a better job. Um, if you have more questions, uh, please do email me or better yet, um, post them on Piazza and I will do my best to fill in all the remaining gaps that I possibly can.